Hi, everybody. Welcome back to New York City. We're here at the New York Stock Exchange overlooking the trading floor. My name is Dave Vellante, and this is the NYSE plus the Cube, NYSE Wired plus the Cube CXO series. We're here with Chase Lockmiller, who's the co-founder and CEO of Crusoe. Chase, good to see you. Thanks for coming on theCUBE. Thanks for having me, Dave. So for, when did you start the company and why? What was the founding premise? Yeah, so uh, I started Crusoe in 2018, so about six and a half years ago, um, actually with a, with a friend of mine from high school. Um, and uh, you know, the premise was really to help accelerate computing-led technologies and computing-led innovations like AI uh, in, in, a in a capacity that could be uh, sustainably powered. So really at this convergence of, of AI and energy in terms of you know, how do we unlock all of these incredible innovative potentials uh, without having to bear large-scale environmental consequences. Did you have like early visibility on Gen AI? Was it a gut feel? Um, yeah, so uh, maybe taking a step back, I, I had sort of spent the early part of my career uh, as a quant portfolio manager. And in that role, we had adopted a lot of deep learning techniques. And you know, I'd, 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 you know, I went to Stanford for grad school and uh, you know, focused on AI in grad school. Uh, and you know, I'd sort of seen all of this incredible innovation taking place and all of these massive breakthroughs in terms of performance for computer vision and natural language processing. Um, that was all being driven by these next generation nonlinear modeling techniques, these multi-layer neural networks. Um, and, and computing was a big driver of making this possible. It was both, you know, the, the, the two things that really made this possible were, uh, you know, we finally had enough data to train these types of models that had been around for decades. And we finally had enough computing power and we could parallelize it uh, in a way that, that actually made it uh, computationally feasible um, to converge on something that worked. And so, uh, you know, at, at that point, I really had a high conviction that AI was going to be transformative for, you know, every aspect of the human experience. And, um, you know, I, I, uh, we had sort of this seminal moment in the breakthrough with uh, ChatGPT being launched in November 2022. Um, I probably would have predicted that it would have happened sooner, uh, personally. But uh, really, yeah, I just, I, you know, it was. Uh, I think anyone building in around the space, like, you know, when you when you see. When you see like the performance gains we were seeing from a lot of, you know, deep learning techniques, and as people were iterating on them, you know, it really felt like magic, right? Like you, you had this like superhuman capability, um, you know, oftentimes in a in a narrowly scoped application, but uh, you know, you could extrapolate in your mind how we would get there to you know superhuman uh, performance across you know numerous applications, and you know that's kind of what we're seeing today with you know uh, a, a bunch of breakthroughs. So when you saw ChatGPT, it was like, okay, finally. Is that right? I mean, is that fair? I, I mean, I, sure. I, I had my own sense of awe the first time I used it, and I was like, "Wow, we like we're there. We're, yeah. You know, this is happening. Um, uh, you know, we're we're like like this, this like very close to passes the Turing test, and you know, right. at this point, does pass the Turing test. Uh, and you know, this is this is the seminal moment and uh, really the breakthrough in AI that we've been. We've and been and the reason for. I ask that, um, not to put you on the spot, but I have a friend no. who's deep into AI, like you were no. at the time. He's been at it for 20 years, whether it's AI and autonomous driving, and you know, really, really understands it well. And I had dinner with him right after ChatGPT was on. He says, did you ever hear of Eliza? And I'm like, no, I've never heard of Eliza. Well, it was actually an IBM mainframe program that you could interact with in natural language back in, I think, the 60s or early yeah. 70s. And people were like, wow. And they were using it to, to help people with you know, mental disorders just feel like they could speak to someone and, and have an interaction. And so now it's like, fast forward, wow, we're here. Totally. in a way that it is actually has the computing power can be done you know scaled broadly and i guess inexpensively enough but the problem is we've got to cool all this stuff and we've got to make it sustainable and, Absolutely. and that was your founding premise and and why is that good business well look we think you know i, I kind of consider myself to be like a you know libertarian environmentalist like I, you know I care deeply about the planet but we have to make these things work uh, on a standalone economic basis um, and you know no matter how you look at it we're gonna need to bring on net new generation to power AI the energy demands are just so massive um, but what's what's uh, what leaves me to be very very optimistic at this moment in time is we're sort of finally at this point where cleaner energy generation is marginally cheaper than fossil based generation Right. So you're seeing, you know, the, clean, the, 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 the lowest cost sources of energy are, you know, wind, solar, you know, geothermal in certain locations, hydro in certain locations. Um, 
and nuclear if we could get out of our own way from a regulatory compliance standpoint. But uh, uh, you know, th that's one of the things that leaves me very, very optimistic about you know being able to power AI in a sustainably, you know, based capacity. Um, and uh, to me, it was like really important to to approach it this way because if we if we had massive breakthroughs in you know in terms of uh, realizing AGI, but uh, it accelerated a climate crisis to this, you know, to the extent that we made 95% of the, you know, species on Earth go extinct. Like, you know, did we, did we win or did we lose? Right. Like that. that that's kind of like. Uh, yeah. uh, we, we really want to kind of have a, a very abundant future that's rich in technology, but but also uh, you know rich in nature as well. So, you're in the technology community. You're a builder. I've been in this business for a long, long time, and. It seems like the narrative around tech, not seems like, the narrative around tech has shifted. You know, when I was a kid, um, it was very positive sort of attitudes toward tech. Grew up in Massachusetts, and 128 was the sort of pre-Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. And and we almost put it on a pedestal, sort of glorified tech. And today it's, oh, you know, big tech, tech, la tech lash, and social media is bad. And granted, there's, there's plenty of, things that are negative about big tech, but what often gets lost in the conversation is all the good that tech has done. I bring that up because, of course, the media goes right after the energy consumption, whether it was same with crypto. We, we heard that as a big negative. Now we're hearing that with AI. I bring it up because I was listening to a report around Eric Schmidt this morning. I don't mm -hmm. know if you heard this, mm -hmm. where he was basically saying, look, if you try to constrict, his premise was it's a mistake to try to constrict AI based upon the energy argument, let it go. AI will help us figure out a way to reduce, you know, the energy consumption, maybe by taking carbon out of the atmosphere. Sure. Maybe it'll come up with some way of doing that. Do you have any thoughts on that? Totally. Um, and, and I'd love to hear your perspective. Yeah, you know, I, I often uh, describe this as the, you know, the the energy paradox with AI, which is, you know, AI's, you know, there's there's all these gripes about AI's energy usage. And you know the solution to AI's energy usage is AI. Uh, yeah. You know AI is the tool that we we we've been looking for, that's going to be able to drive these scientific breakthroughs that we need to achieve low cost, sustainably powered futures. Um, you know this is applied across uh, you know technologies like fusion and advancing fusion developments and right. um, uh, you know a lot of uh, you know particle physics and plasma physics simulations. Uh, and with, with these very complex geometries can really only be done with large scale uh, accelerated computing infrastructure. Um, uh, you know, things like uh, advanced ba battery chemistries, right? We've, we've really only scratched the surface in terms of, uh, you know, the, the material science and, and, and the, the battery chemistry space that's, you know, possible and cost effective. And, you know, what do these things mean at scale? <clears throat> you know, there's certain chemistries that have become popular, but, you know, the, the, the search space is far wider than we've ever uh, really fundamentally explored, and um, you know, there's there's companies that uh, you know we had a big partnership with uh, SES AI recently as a you know public traded uh, yeah. battery technology company that um, you know we're working on uh, supplying the uh, the AI compute infrastructure uh, to support the development of this uh, foundational model for inorganic chemistry uh, in in, uh, in in something called DFT diffusion uh, function theory, uh, which is sort of the underlying scientific uh, theory that that sort of describes these battery chemistries, and uh, you know, again, the search space is massive. You know, we haven't been able to fully explore it with traditional uh, classical techniques, um, but AI really is the solution there. I'll give you one more example. Um, you know, we're we're uh, uh, I, met, I met a company recently called Orbital Materials. Uh, it, was a, it was a team that spun out from uh, DeepMind, and uh, what they're focused on is is actually. Uh, using AI to develop these uh, custom engineered materials for direct air capture systems that are purpose built for specific thermal uh, thermal thermal loads. Um, so what I mean by that is that you know one of the key inputs to a direct air capture system is heat. Uh, the materials we often use to basically soak up that carbon um, are things that are oftentimes naturally occurring that can be carbon sinks, things like limestone. So, you know, just because it naturally occurs in nature doesn't mean it's the best and most economic way to uh, soak carbon out from the atmosphere. Um, you know, in the data center world, one of our key uh, exhaust products is heat, right? 
Right. Um, but it's but it's, it's it's low temperature heat. It's oftentimes not that useful for a lot of different applications. Uh, but one of the things that you know we were talking about is like, could we engineer a purpose built, custom engineered material that was designed to basically absorb carbon with the thermal load? Um, that's the exhaust of our data centers. It, what, what about that? You could have a renewably powered data center that's taking the waste heat from that data center to suck up carbon from the atmosphere. You'd have a carbon negative data center. Yeah. Um, so to me, that's Eric Schmidt is spot yeah. on. And I, I'm so optimistic about AI being the mechanism to invent the solutions needed to power the future well, sustainably. These are such, such novel ideas you're talking about. Of course, they're, they're, they're created by humans. Wow, imagine when you put AI <laughs> in there. But now that doesn't mean that we shouldn't approach AI in an ener energy efficient manner. And that's what you're doing. You're building, you're scaling AI, you're building energy efficient data centers and AI ecosystems. Uh, tell us more about Crusoe. Sure, so, uh, you know, Crusoe is a, a vertically integrated AI infrastructure business. We, uh, we try to take an energy first approach where we build data centers in locations that have low cost, clean and abundant energy. Um, you know, the traditional data center model is sort of build data centers in the networking hubs like Northern Virginia, and then everybody wants to be in kind of like that, that, that data center corridor. Um, we're building in, you know, less traditional data center markets, areas like uh, West Texas, where you have very abundant uh, wind and solar power that's oftentimes curtailed or negatively priced. Um, and actually the biggest problem is they don't have enough load. Um, uh, other markets like uh, Iceland, where, you know, there's rich geothermal and hydropower uh, that, that is more than abundant enough to power, you know, the, the needs of the 400,000 people that live in Iceland, you know, they can turn on a lot more generation. They just have no, no natural need for it. It's all carbon free power. Uh, we can build large scale GPU clusters there uh, to train these big large language models and power them in a sustainable basis. That's also very cost effective. Um, so we, we really have two core products. You know, the first is actually just the data center layer where we will uh, build these large scale AI data centers. We typically lease them to you know, very big companies like, like the hyperscalers. Um, and then we have a layer above that that's a managed AI cloud platform uh, that's a serverless architecture for AI startups and, and bigger enterprises that are looking to do something in AI, um, whether it's training, fine tuning, or, or inference, um, you know, we can really help support them with uh, uh, serverless compute infrastructure. Interesting business model. Is there, a, there are companies that, that are basically alternative to cloud, to hyperscalers that sell sort of GPU clouds, you do that, but you also build data centers. Yep. Which is a, a different business. Uh, it's related, but it's but, but it's it's novel in the sense that you know most companies pick one. Yep. Um, that, but it seems sort of a synergistic, but also as we were talking about last night, it throws off cash. It's it's lucrative. Yep. It's long term contracts. Yep. And so it it brings stability. I, I don't. I don't know how the economics compare long term with the other business, but nonetheless, it's it, it sounds like it's pretty viable. Yeah, look, I, I think um, what we're seeing in the data center design space is a completely like new paradigm. Um, you know, the, what a data center was 20 years ago compared to an AI data center today, it's a completely different uh, design from a cooling, from a power density, from a rack density. Uh, from an, from a, from a, how much space it's required, mm -hmm. um, and you know, as as Jensen Huang, the CEO of Nvidia, likes to say, is that you know the data center is the new unit of compute. So, from my perspective, in order to be um, you know at the cutting edge, building world class uh, AI compute infrastructure, you don't just have to be good at you know putting a cluster together. I think you know having a lot of informed expertise around the actual data center itself. Um, is a critical component to uh, being successful there, and so we've tried to we've tried to do both from uh, both the data center side as well as the you know infrastructure software layer, the high performance software defined networking architecture that enables um, you know high performance AI workloads uh, to train in in, the, in sort of these multi node or multi GPU capacities. Tell me more about your software IP. Sure. Um, so we've done a lot uh, to create a, a very high performance virtualization stack. Um, that enables uh, innovators to basically engage with uh, the AI compute infrastructure uh, 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 to, to, to drive forward their specific use case, whether it's training a new model, running a big inference workload. 
Um, but we've tried to engineer things, uh, you know, with AI as the use case in mind. So, um, you know, there's there's a bunch of different elements that that really make us special. Um, a lot of like low level kernel optimizations that we've made that uh, make things like startup times way faster for, mm -hmm. uh, for 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 bringing up these big clusters. Um, but you know, the cluster really is kind of what a lot of people are focused on. Um, so the networking stack becomes incredibly important. Um, and building this high performance software defined network that we've done at Crusoe that enables multi-tenancy multi across the network um, has been a, a critical aspect um, because we have, we'll, we'll oftentimes have a single cluster of GPUs that's in what's called a rail optimized architecture, which means you can share information directly from one GPU directly into memory with, an, with another GPU. You're not, you know, you're sort of bypassing any, you know, it's not like data is going from GPU memory to the CPU or, you know, to the, to the core networking. Uh, the, the, the NIC, uh, you know, across the, the Ethernet fabric, you're actually going across an InfiniBand fabric in a high performance, high bandwidth capacity um, uh, to be able to, you know, run these multi-node workloads. So but isn't that a function of the large SRAM that, that NVIDIA has? Are you, are you adding IP on top of that versus say a chiplet architecture, which is going to be, you know, asynchronous to the, all the XP, <sighs> XPUs? My understanding is that NVIDIA is with that large memory, shared memory, uh, has you know direct access for all the GPUs. You are you adding IP on top of that, or just optimizing it? Correct. So, so so what you're talking about is actually what's on the chip. So the the, the on chip uh, HBM, you know, an H100 has 80 gigs of HBM, uh, and and you know these models and the data sets are, are are far bigger than that. So you actually need not only multiple GPUs. There's typically eight GPUs on a server. Uh, but but actually multiple nodes. And you're NV linking um, across correct. those multiple so, nodes. Well, you're NV linking across the GPUs on a single server. Yes, and and, then, and, and each of those GPUs has its own NIC that's right. connected into this non-blocking InfiniBand fabric to connect to directly into memory of all the other GPUs. So you have, you have sort of this uh, you know, large cluster of GPUs that act in sync, uh, in, in sync with one another. Um, and then being able to, you know, what, what's special about the network that I was describing earlier is being able to cluster that all together and then be able to support multi-tenancy across the cluster mm -hmm. so that, you, you know, you have, you know, a, a 2000 GPU cluster. You may have one customer that only wants 256 GPUs. You may have another that has 512 GPUs. But being able to sort of support those multiple customers uh, in a shared infrastructure uh, where you're not driving any sort of noisy neighbor problems or data leakage or any of these different problems um, is actually a fairly complex high performance yeah, that's, working That's model. your virtualization IP that you talked about before. You're dealing with noisy Correct. neighbors yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And, and performance well, we, balancing and so forth. Yeah, and we also offer you know, a bunch of other you know, aspects in terms of you know, we have a great uh, you know, distributed file system offering that you know, we've, we've done in partnership with Vast. Yeah. Um, we have uh, a great high-performance block storage offering um, uh, that we've done with uh, Lightbits as, as, as our partner there, um, and then uh, you know we have a great managed Kubernetes uh, offering as well for for, for folks that are uh, focused on uh, Kubernetes implementations. I understand that there's a problem. I, I guess I call it checkpointing, where if you have to, if if a job fails, you got to restart. Uh, yep. Now, and and I've, I've heard folks. I think HPE talks about this a lot. Dell as well, but. It sounds like software to me. Is this a problem that you guys solve in your software stack that you can sort of take checkpoints so I don't have to start over from you know, yeah. the beginning? Or so how much of a problem? No, is it's this? a huge. It's a, yeah. it's a huge problem. Mm -hmm. Stability is actually one of our. Uh, that is that is one of the things that we pride ourselves on most, uh, and we've, where we've been able to create the most differentiation from from many other other platforms. Um, and you know, this is both a hardware problem as well as a software problem. There. I think oftentimes people will uh, just assume that these things will work, mm -hmm. but they're super complex systems, right? You have all of these GPUs trying to work together in sync on a single compute problem. And each of those GPUs has its own NIC. Each of those uh, things are connected into, you know, these, these uh, 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 all of these uh, high performance InfiniBand switches with transceivers and optics. And there's so many different moving parts that any one of those things failing creates the entire job to fail, and then you have to sort of wait until it gets resolved, and then you can restart your job. So, uh, you know, failures are uh, uh, are very bad <laughs> in terms of uh, uh, the cost. The, expensive. You know, the, yeah. They're very expensive. From the the time, uh, the downtime that you experience from from failures is is massive. Um, now there are certain certain failures that can be solved in software. There's other failures that need to be solved 
you know, in hardware or, you know, different, uh, you know, physical configurations in terms of, you know, where do I use active copper? Where, where do I use fiber versus active copper? Like, mm -hmm. where do I, uh, you know, use this type of transceiver versus that? You know, there's a bunch of different trade-offs that you can kind of make in the overall cluster design um, and in the uh, virtualization And that's stack. IP that you guys develop and or your partner for that or you, you're Cor sort of Correct, some of these yeah. things are trade secrets, some of them are, you know, uh, uh, things you work on with partners yeah. like NVIDIA or AMD or, uh, you know, HP or Dell, Supermicro. I mean, the, it's a great ecosystem, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that we've had to figure out on our own. I, I want to come back and, and close and pick your brain on, on cooling. We were talking last night a little bit yep. about when I first started in the industry, IBM was kind of everything. They were the dominant monopoly. Yep. People don't even remember. Long time ago, before I came in the industry, IBM had two thirds of the revenue of the industry and 50% of the profits. That's how dominant yep. IBM was. So at the back in the day, you would get this education from IBM on semiconductors and this thing called the TCM, the thermal conduction module, mm -hmm. which was a liquid cooled mm -hmm. sort of mainframe system. Yep. Yep. It was every time you got a briefing from IBM, they talked about the TCM. There was a real IP in there. And then of course, you know, microprocessors took over and Intel became dominant. Now liquid cooling is back. We, we mm -hmm. know that is kind of the, the dominant approach. Uh, but help us understand the different uh, types of, of liquid, the different liquid cooling approaches sure. that are effective and maybe what you guys are using. Yeah, so, you know, starting first with the problem, I mean, historically data centers have been air cooled and right. the way it works is, you know, the chip will have a heat sink on top, uh, you know, a piece of aluminum that has some fins to create more surface area. And then the idea is you blow cold air over those fins and it sort of gets the heat off the chip, you know, effectively. And that works well for, you know, many CPUs, even, you know, earlier iterations of GPUs, the A100 had 300 watts of power, which is the previous gen from NVIDIA. The H100, today's kind of, you know, uh, cutting edge solution is, is uh, 700 watts of power, so it's more than doubled. Um, and, 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 and this air-cooled mechanism, it still works, um, but, you know, it, it, is, it is a higher density configuration. Um, now the next generation, the Blackwell, the GB200 is 1200 watts of power. Um, and so with that amount of power and that less, small of a space- less floating point precision for, for, in part anyway, for that purpose, right? Or, uh, or, no, or no, they'll support, well, yeah. The, uh, yeah anyway, the, they, support, they support yeah. a whole range of, yeah, okay. of uh, floating point. Um, but uh, anyway, the, uh, uh, from a cooling perspective, you're sort of put in a position where you almost have to figure out some mechanism to get that thermal load off the chip in a more more efficient way, otherwise like you're gonna burn out the chip. Right. Um, there's just like too much heat in a single spot. Um, so uh, that's that's led us down this path of like, okay, what are what are what are cooling solutions that could work? Um, so the, the the primary approach today is uh, uh, what's called direct to chip liquid cooling. It's where you actually have a, a chilled water loop where you have cold water that flows in through a copper pipe. Um, that copper pipe uh, you know uh, flows over the chip. Uh, the, the silicon and, and sort of, you know, the heat is sort of, uh, you know, water is more thermally conductive than air and the, and the heat is able to sort of get off the chip uh, effectively and then it goes through a, a, a heat exchanging loop. Um, you know, but there are other, other, other uh, different, you know, cooling solutions as well, things like single phase immersion cooling and uh, two phase immersion cooling. So single phase, you know, you're using a non-conductive dielectric fluid to basically uh, flow a uh, thermally conductive fluid over over the chip, um, and and you're able to sort of get the heat off, you know, you know more effectively. Um, uh, but it doesn't actually change phase. Two phase immersion cooling, you actually are using these fluorocarbons, these these uh, these fluorocarbon fluids that actually boil at the surface of the chip, and that boiling process is is very phase efficient at, at, yeah. uh, at getting things off. Uh, now the final uh, plug I'll make here uh, that I I think is just you know a pretty interesting dynamic at play. Um, you know, there's a company called the Diamond Foundry, um, uh, you know, that 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 I, I heard is uh, actually working on uh, these custom built uh, diamond heat sinks. Uh, so, you know, they're, they're lab made diamonds and, and uh, you know, diamond is like, you know, beyond being this like desired uh, material for, for, for uh, uh, materialistic purposes um, is actually, you know, the, one of the most thermally conductive materials in the world. Um, so you, if you can actually disperse the heat load with a, with a diamond heat sink um, that's actually you know, just designed in that custom form factor in a lab, uh, 
you can actually way more efficiently disperse the heat off the chip. So, so there are like some really cool things that oh. people are thinking about, and yeah. uh, you know these types of things are are what do, excites me. Do you me have about to buy future. those from De Beers? Because I know diamonds are plentiful, <laughs> but the market is the market is cornered. Blood but, diamond heat yeah. sinks. Yeah, but yeah. So, <laughs> and, and I, I got uh, at GTC last year. It was kind of the first time I've ever really, really paid attention to, you know, what the hoses in the supercomputer look like, and it looked really convoluted and made one wonder about you know connection integrity and things of this nature at, at scale i mean do those things matter are there standards for sort of how you approach liquid cooling absolutely and you know that like liquid cooling i mean you mentioned ibm doing it um but you know a lot of large supercomputers at you know government labs um you know people had experimented a lot with liquid cooling in the more traditional high-performance computing space. Um, it had mostly been experimental, sort of proof of concept. Uh, it's never been deployed at the scale we're about to deploy it with the Blackwell uh, you know, rollout. Right. And so all of this stuff is being figured out as we speak. Um, like, like, honestly, it's like a, a ton of liquid cooling has been deployed, but it's gonna, it's a, it's a drop in the bucket compared to the amount that's about to uh, hit the market wow. next year. And so, to your point, there aren't standards, right? I mean, there, there are, there are sort of, you know, different people have different solutions, whether it's, you know, uh, you know, Vertiv or HP or Cool IT, and you know, a bunch of these different uh, vendors out there that are, you know, uh, advocating for for different solutions. But it is. Um, it is. It does feel a bit like the wild, wild west, and it introduces this whole new engineering challenge to designing a data center, which is which is plumbing. You know, I, I think one of our one of our most in demand jobs is is plumbers, right? It's yeah, like we right. have to we have to run so much piping. It's so complex to to plumb these systems together right, uh, in in an effective capacity. And and, and I, I just remember seeing it, saying, "Wow, that's a." I'm looking for the weakest link. I'm like, yeah. oh, wait, what am I missing here? Because this looks like amateur yeah. hour when you. No, when you and, look and at this. to your point, if you if if these things cause failures, right in in the cluster, you're going to have a lot of unhappy customers Shame that are going to have to have to stop yeah, right. and start their their training workload. We're never going right. to reach AGI. So well, the, the hose broke. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, what? yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, get the call, call the plumber. Get Mario uh, in here. Uh, Chase, uh, thank you so much for yeah. your time. This was yeah. such an interesting conversation. Awesome. Really appreciate thank it. Thank you, Dave. All right. Really well, appreciate we'll it. Happy to have you back. Yeah, in our absolutely. Palo Alto studio or back here or even yeah. Boston if you get yeah. there. All yeah, yeah, right. would love that. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Okay, and thanks for watching. Keep it right there. This is Dave Vellante for the Cube plus NYSE Wired, our CXO series. We'll be right back right after this short break.